Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of deeplearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the deeplearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at Deep Learning AI? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. Uh, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks. See you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Kian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new. Uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. And that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Fortel, who is on their product team. Hey, Andrew. Do you want to say hi? to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on. I would love to. Hi everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks also. Thanks Andrew. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, datasets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Good morning, everybody. Good evening and good afternoon, depending where you're watching around the world tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We have a great discussion we're going to have today. Uh, we have some phenomenal physician scientists. And as everybody knows, uh, if you follow me or read anything that I write, that I'm very passionate about having uh, physicians be involved uh, with technology and be able to craft it and develop it so that we make sure that we bring that concept of being a physician to the industry to make sure that what we are doing is benefiting our patients. 
So I'm very excited to be having this discussion. We're going to be talking about data, which we all love. Uh, we all know is important, especially for machine learning, for NLP, uh, and to be able to be able to leverage data to not just see what's happened in the past, but to start doing predictions. We're going to talk about some of the advantages, disadvantages. We're going to see how that's been changing now during COVID. And what are the things that are coming down the pipe in this ecosystem, in this industry that we should be looking for? We have two phenomenal leaders in the industry that are going to be talking to us about this tonight. And I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we will. But before we get to the stars of the evening, I would like to introduce you to my bow tie brother, um, <laughs> Fritz, for the evening. Fritz, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm really excited too. You, it looks like you have a dog behind you. Who's that behind you, Fritz? Yeah, I've got Louie. Um, he's oh. also ready to hear um, cool. all the things we talk about. He's excited. Does Louie have a bow tie as well? Not on right now. He's got a little bandana. Cool. All right. Well, Fritz, I will give the evening to you to introduce our phenomenal speakers. Please take it away. All right. I'll start with introducing Dr. Nace. Dr. David Nace is the Chief Medical Officer at Innovasser, a category creating healthcare data activation platform on a mission to organize healthcare information to make it accessible. He has over 25 years of executive management experience in healthcare in the roles of senior vice president and chief medical officer at United Healthcare, Atna, and McKesson Corporation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Nace. You have had such a fascinating career, and I know our audience would love to get some of the wisdom that you've gained. I would love to hear more about what you and your company are doing right now to leverage data to improve patient care. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Fritz. It's really great to be here. Um, so, you know, I'm a physician, uh, primary care trained. I uh, never was a data or a computer science guy. I know many of my colleagues, you know, they I've never written a line of code. Um, and, you know, I was always struck by in healthcare, I often say it's a medieval model <laughs> um, because it's an apprenticeship train model. You learn from a master, you learn the techniques of that master, and as a patient, if I go to a physician, I'm going to get one thing or a different thing, depending on which physician I go to. And that didn't make any sense to me because we are not in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, we're in a, a world where things are connected, where things are standardized. And so my journey has been, I, I was at the University of Pittsburgh. I thought if we could bring payers and providers together, we helped build a health plan. And then I got enamored by technology, not data, technology. And uh, we started doing care management and we never really could get things right. So in my course of time at McKesson where we had lots of technology, I could not understand why we just spent in our technology team just moving data around. Like every time we would do something different, we'd have to build a new warehouse, do ETL processes, it would take six, seven months. By the time you were done, things changed. So you'd have to build another warehouse or another schema and then move data back into a different schema. And I said, I don't know why I can use my phone and call an Uber. <laughs> and I'm still just moving data around. And the data quality was poor. So I came out to San Francisco, met these incredible founders at Innovacer. We were trying to revolutionize health, healthcare by making pure, pristine data come in from multiple places into the cloud and make it useful, patient-centered, and trustable, uh, and high quality, so that everyone can work as a team and do standard processes, move us out of the Middle Ages. And so things like AI, machine learning are critical pieces of what we do to make that magic happen. And, and that's, I'm just so excited about the work we're doing and the tremendous growth we've had here at Innovacer and the partners we have, such as our next guest from Citrus. All right, I would love to now introduce Dr. Patel as well. Um, he's uh, also a physician in emergency medicine with a focus on healthcare IT aimed at improving clinical data workflow and improved detection of disease. As the chief medical officer at SciTru, Dr. Patel provides clinical understanding and a physician's perspective to unstructured clinical data. Thank you so much for being here as well. I am sure our audience would love to hear more about how SciTru is leveraging NLP to augment data in healthcare. Thank you for having me. Um, David, your intro was pretty much my story. So, so I, mean, I, I come from a background where we're taking care of patients. We don't have time to take care of the computer. And uh, I, I think it was, 
near the end of burning out of my career on the front lines when I, I think I just got this cool invite to this conference in, in the Valley. Uh, I attended it, had this very interesting lecture on NLP. I didn't know what it was. I, didn't know, I mean, I knew how to spell NLP and that was about it. And uh, it was really the kind of thing where I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I, I suddenly don't need all these staff who are really spinning their wheels trying to look at these paper charts coming in through the fax line and you know, stacking up my consultations for me. And, uh, uh, you know, it was probably that, that moment, that transformational moment for me was uh, at a breakfast in Sacramento when, when our now our CEO, Kyle Silvestro, flips open this notebook and says, I'm going to show you something really cool. Uh, the software is going to read uh, this health record and spit out these, uh, in, in these insights in, in like a, a few seconds. And, you know, boom, four pages, probably like 6,000 words of text were just transformed in front of my eyes. And, and so that was that moment when I was like, yeah, maybe I don't need to be on the front line. I need to be on sort of the back end of things and, and sort of see if I can bring some more of this kind of spirit to the, to the fore. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a guy who's, you know, I, I spent time on the, in the ER front lines. I spent time in uh, chronic care clinics. Um, but I don't think it really matters where you come from. It's all the same. We, we are an information technology. Healthcare is uh, at its core an information technology. And, and we're just, we're not treating the information very well. So, so our, our, our company, SciTrue, which was really just a, a stealth mode company back at that Sacramento breakfast, uh, you know, went from two people to now 20. Uh, we, you know, we went from this conceptual thing that we were doing where we were looking at records and, and sort of taking the insights out of it. And, and, and we are now touching, you know, probably some of the uh, largest healthcare vendors and companies, one of which is Innovacer, uh, and helping to do uh, our part, which is to help clean up data and, and then really give it to, you know, give it to our partners to do really cool things with. So, yeah, absolutely excited. Uh, I think you don't have to come from a tech background to be involved in AI. If there's a message here, it's uh, that you can come from really a uh, you know any kind of discipline, and you can have an influence uh, in this field, and it's growing exponentially as Andrew started with uh, with his intro. Yeah, thank you so much. That is really cool. Um, I wanted to ask about something you said about having like patients at the center of data. So, how are data structures typically in healthcare systems, and how are you guys like restructuring it? Well, let me let me start by saying that you know we knew that healthcare was way behind in the digital um, you know uh, uh, explosion that we've experienced over the last thirty years, and um, you know when the opportunity came to try to change that, which was the economic recession we had uh, twenty years ago, uh, the High Tech Act was passed, and we thought we'd spend all this money uh, digitalizing healthcare. We ended up with EMRs electronic medical records, which basically solidified the, the sort of medieval type of practices that we had before. They, they, in essence, ended up being billing machines. And now we have physicians who um, only see the information that they or their system has about a patient. They don't see all the other information that a, that a patient uh, journey has in terms of their own health. Actually, I have a slide that shows a nice picture of that. And then... Um, this would be a good time to bring it up. So this is the experience we all have, right? We, we all have like um, a primary care doctor. We might have, um, and they might have an electronic medical record. We, we may, if we have a chronic disease, have some vendor who has a care manager assigned to us. They have their own system. We have social workers. They have a system. Our family member might have a, a watch. Uh, everybody has a different system. We go to a hospital. They have a different system. We go to a different hospital, they have a different system. We go to a rehab hospital, we go to a pharmacy, they have a different system. There's no complete view of the patient. The patient's not at the center. The doctor or the health system or a provider is at the center. So if we go to the next slide, this is the way that we see the world. Um, if you can have all that data be key and bring it together and harmonize it, make it useful, and that, there's a lot of stuff involved in that, how to make it useful, and then have all of these providers, the pharmacy, the doctor, the care manager, the um, family member, all operating off the same data, the same way we use our phone for, then the patient becomes the center of the data and everybody re revolves around that or what we often say, everyone begins to be able to care as one for the health, the health of an employee, health of a health plan member, the health of a patient in a practice. Uh, but you know, people get to, be patients at the center, and that's the key. 
You can take this slide. So Dave, I'll, I'll ask you a question. I mean, to that point, because I love that image, right? It's an ecosystem. So we have EMRs, you know, the High Tech Act basically financed the, you know, basically the equation for burnout and, and you know, basically overclicking and you know, four hours of basically take home charting every night by almost every position in, in, in the world. Could you touch it? So, so what were the what were the gaps? Why, why couldn't systems, you know, talk to each other? Um, and it, it's, it's a question I'm posing for you because I'd love to hear how you you formulate because I want to show you know how, what we're doing with with some of that data. So that's that's an excellent question. I'll tie together what we do as partners between Innovator and Citru on that note. Um, so the High Tech Act, which was the attempt to digitalize healthcare um, instead of cementing it in a computer world, which is what we ended up doing. Um, is that there were no standards around healthcare data. You know, it was just some 15 years before that that the US government passed a standardized coding system to submit claims, to pay for services. Before that, each of the payers had their own, uh, you know, standards for what they would call uh, a doctor visit or uh, having, you know, an echo done. And so um, standardizing that, uh, along with the American Medical Association, became a big leap. And then the International Classification of Diseases was another standard that some people were using and some people weren't. The High Tech Act created a need to at least create some standards. They created Rx norm, a standardization for general med medicines, but they didn't really standardize everything, just some things, some core things. And so we end up with a lot of things that um, are highly variable. I was on the phone with a, a large health system today we said when they get a, a, a report on a diabetic for a hemoglobin A1C in their community, there are seven different ways of how you look at the numerator and denominator for that measure. Some people say under eight, some people say over nine, and they calculate it differently. And they're like, what do we believe? So we don't have standards around that. And we know 80%, some 70, 80% of the information in healthcare is in text written notes. It's in the doctor's notes when they write it into the field, uh, the text field, or it's it's in the uh, lab laboratory report from the pathology that came out of the surgery, which is has a three page or the radiology report. There's no codification around that. And so there's no way to really take all this data, put it in a data lake, it, harmonize it and you make it useful. And that's the challenge we have in this country. No, that's awesome. I mean, I think that's, that's about, as distilled as it's going to get, right? We have six hundred plus thousand physicians who all write, speak, and notate differently. We have uh, a lack of, you know, documentation standards. So when it comes down to uh, either you force everybody into a single lane, or you say, look, be creative, be you know, be physicians, and and, and let's not try to you know make everybody conform. But then you end up with this heterogeneous, you know, heterogeneous issue. So um, I, if you want to put up the uh, second slide on um, on my deck, I can actually show you kind of what, what we're doing at Slide 2, just really to empower the interoperability um, around natural language processing. The processing pipeline. Ah, there it is. Yeah, so you know this this looks complex, but what I wanted to kind of draw the attention to is people talk about NLP and and the processing pipeline for natural language, and it's really just one kernel. I mean, it's it's, it's a really you know important, but it's a small part of this overall um, you know kind of process that's involved when you look at people's uh, health records. And this can be health records coming out of EMR systems, out of you know uh, legacy systems from from uh, you know diagnostic devices. It could be uh, chart notes from you know nurses in the community. It really doesn't matter where the records are coming from, but NLP, as, as a lot of people probably, I mean, there's, there's probably people listening in on this conversation who are, are deep experts in this. Um, and, and what they may know about NLP is, is the thing that's sort of sitting in this column, which is you know these, these various data science, you know, very mathematical, very statistical type of approaches to you know ranking information or, or distinguishing you know pieces of information. But the part that David talks about is really, I think, really stuck in here. This is the, this is the real world, right? This is these various types of reports, all different standards, all different ways of notation. Um, you know, so you get this you know, British, this massive wave or tsunami of, of documents that come into a health system. 
uh, and you have this big problem, which is I, I don't know um, what this page looks like or what this page means. I don't know what to do to call this a consultation note versus an imaging report. So what do we do? We throw human beings at it. We, we have a lot of people who really spend lots of time, um, you know, trying to classifying things. So we, we actually use techniques in machine learning. We use techniques in, um, you know, uh, you know, zone detection, all, all these types of different things that we do to sort of say, okay, this is what report I'm actually holding at this moment. And then we are able to then deploy, you know, NLP uh, technology. We then have a terminology server. So again, to your point around R Rx norm or ICD or mesh or med, all these different, um, you know, ontologies or terminologies that are out there in healthcare that are very important to different stakeholders. We can actually start to pull these concepts off the page and, and start mapping them to that, you know, to these different terminologies. And then really as it gets past this moment where you've got the terminology mapping done, then that's where the real, so I, I say fun starts is because now you, you're able to analyze this information that you have and you're able to say, okay, well, if I, if I have a bunch of information about somebody's past, what does that tell me about the patient? So what does that tell me about the risk? What does it tell me about, you know, for example, um, you know, things that we know might be an occurrence for them in, in, the, in the future. So the, the analyzers help us kind of you know, put information together in a much more cohesive way. And then on top of that, we have the ability to put creative rules on top of all of this. So, for, so just when you look at this big problem of all this data and all these different systems that don't talk to each other, um, a lot has to get done in order for you know, a document to get from this side to something that's actually structured and usable. And then when you get to the end of all of this and you think the story's over, it's actually not because now you've got to have this kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of positive or, you know, reverse feedback kind of model where you're looking at creating high quality data sets so that other people can use them. So you have to validate, you have to look at this information. So it's, you know, I think this, this problem of, uh, of, of the, it, the lack of interoperabil uh, interoperability is, is sort of very ever present. It's still there. We talk to large health systems, we talk to insurance companies and, you know, it seems like, um, you know, AI is the path. Uh, we, I mean, we're all here for this, this conversation, but AI is the path. It's, it's, it's the way that we're going to, you know, sort of really normalize a lot of this information and, and still have it so that people aren't spending hours, uh, you know, at the end of the day charting. I, I think that's going to have to go away and, uh, you know, bring, bring the patient back into focus uh, with the physician and their caregivers and sort of leave us off the screen. And I think this is kind of one path to do that. Do you have another question? Oh, yes. Um, so that was really interesting. And I see kind of how that all of those things, the restructuring would help the uh, physicians have like a, an easier time, I guess, like accessing all this information. But can you go into a little bit more about like how this would affect specifically the patients? And, you know, we talk about how the focus is on the, the patients. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on in healthcare. You know, I talked about it being in the medieval times. It still re relatively is, although we now have really good billing machines. Um, <laughs> um, you know, medical errors, an error made because I'm practicing medicine to a patient, uh, is the third leading cause of death. In this country. Medical errors is the third. Well, actually, with COVID, it might drop down to four. I haven't, I haven't checked that in a while. Um, but, you know, that's phenomenal. Like, can you imagine if our driving record was like that? Um, and then, um, you know, only about 50% um, of patients receive recommended treatment. Now, recommended treatment meaning that's uh, evidence-based. And, and what we do know is that from the time people do research and find evidence, that it takes about um, 20 years until it actually 17 years by a RAND report, although that's getting a little dated, until it's really incorporated into the community. Now that may have been compressed as it's been in a while, but still it's a phenomenal time period. Um, you know, until, it, and actually the original RAND report said 17, uh, it was that many years, 17 years until 50% of the doctors are actually adopting it. <laughs> so, right. yeah. so, so what we, yeah, but I'm just, I'm hoping that, you know, that was 20 years ago. I'm hoping that that time frame has compressed a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. And, um, and then, uh, you know, what we now, because we have these billing machines to record stuff, we're now asking doctors to at least record things. 40% of their time, let's say you're the patient, is I'm the doctor doing this. Right. I'm not even looking at you, I'm not interacting with you, and I, I can't, you know, the practice of medicine is a human experience. You know, if you think back to the beginning of, of humankind, it's, it's the, the shaman, it's the healer, and we've lost that because of the digitalization of the billing machine. So, um, 
and because they're entering data because they and so and they're frustrated they're burnt out um you know and so so this is really a problem and and that we know the key as it is in under, other industries is to create a data-driven culture and and uh, in order to do things like these wonderful ideas of using machine learning and AI is to really understand what's going on with my patients, with my population, with my practice, and, and to be able to spot trends, innovate, and, and solve those other problems, reduce medical errors to zero, have recommended treatments being you know, used, and, and actually spend time with patients. And that's, that's, the, that's really the, the holy grail of what we're trying to do here uh, with data. Do you think, David, do you think because, and you keep on, you can ask this too, that, that last concept that you talked about, about spending more time with patients, do you think that you bring that to the table because you're a physician? Do you think that has anything with your ethos and your training? Does it, does it add value uh, when you're thinking about these kinds of problems, your background as a physician? Oh, I can take that one. I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're, when you spend a number of years uh, with your patients and, you have that relationship, but then suddenly you're forced to, like David said, you, you're turning away, you're, 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 you're madly, you know, annotating or, or dictating into a system because uh, a paying uh, a payer wants you to do it that way, or you have to sort of meet these sort of, you know, uh, these, these rules for documentation. And really, um, when you start working with technology, you realize there's so many gaps we're now able to sort of close. So from the perspective of collecting information from the patient before they even get there. Uh, we couldn't do that, you know, very effectively years ago. We can start to do that a little bit more. We have um, things that give us nudges. I mean, there's technologies now that look at CAT scans or MRIs, you know, prior to the radiologist sites uh, falling on them. And they're already doing some sort of, you know, pre-processing kind of give you, um, you know, some clues into, you know, the, maybe a disease process or, or for certain facts in the, in the patient's record that may be, uh, you know, sitting outside of, of a care guideline. So the, the bottom line is, I mean, there's there's information. Um, it, the more you digitize, the more that it can be acted upon. And now these, you know, these technologies are acting on those um, on those pieces of information, and they're kind of assisting or you know supporting uh, clinical workflow or clinical decision making. And and that ultimately means you're you're not combing through you know hundreds of pages. You're not clicking on hundreds of screens to sort of find the information you want. You can have the conversation instead. Um, and you know, really find out what's what's maybe driving the the, the chronic condition, and it may not be, you know, just uh, you know the obvious thing. Sometimes you have to look at the social determinants. I mean, it, you know, those are the kinds of things that you know you wouldn't have an, if you had all the time in the world, you could do really well with every patient. But we don't have the time, so you, you kind of you, you lean into the technology to you know speed it up or to put your eyes on the right types of information, and then you can have you know an actual human conversation. And I think care just gets better. I, I've actually had. Um, uh, a great example uh, of a physician who worked in a very, you know, uh, you know, well-known top-tier U.S. healthcare system. You know, the very expensive EMR and, and you know, huge frustration. They just can't. They couldn't get through a, a patient consultation without li literally having the patient uh, sitting behind them the whole time, and they're literally asking questions that bounce off the wall. And you know, you speak to the patient, and, and they ended up using a system that collected information from the patient prior to the visit. And it just changes the whole experience. Um, you know, it was it, they felt more like they were providing healthcare. It wasn't, uh, you know, providing documentation to support billing. So, yeah, absolutely. You, you bring that ethos into the design process. You bring that into uh, the consultation process with, with potential customers or partners, in, in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And uh, it's a design. It's a design thinking mentality all the way. You uh, and we we have a question from the audience. Before we get to that, what, something you just said. Um, made me think about something I would like to ask both of you guys. In in your experience working with these different healthcare systems, I mean, obviously you guys work with large private systems, um, you've worked with academic systems. Are the problems different between these systems? Are they the same or do, or do you see repetitive things? Uh, give us a little insight to, on your perspective uh, from that. Well, you know, it's a very interesting world uh, in healthcare. Um, uh, when you talk about systems, health systems, which are often hospital-based, in fact, the business of healthcare has become the biggest business in this country, in the U.S., uh, and often the hospital is the largest business in the community. It's it's really sad in many ways that that is the case. That wasn't the case 40 years ago. Um, and, and it's all a, a center of building that people go to, right, you know, to have their services. And that's not patient at the center. Patient at the center should be, their care should be everywhere. 
It should be on their phone, on their computer, in their home. COVID has actually helped them move us forward a little bit with that, with the idea of having virtual care, right? And I know I've had a number of different uh, healthcare interventions myself, and I've been able to do them here in, in uh, my apartment. I wish COVID would go away so I could leave the apartment, but that's <laughs> that's a sort of a different story. And so- Get your vaccine, everyone, get your vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> the PSA. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but, you know, I think that uh, it's one of the silver linings is, is really, I think, helping to, to move that forward. Um, so, I mean, I, I, there's just tremendous opportunity now. The health systems themselves uh, are, are generally, whether it's large or small, struggling with data. Most of them have not moved to the cloud. Yeah. Um, most of them are still using legacy installed systems. Why? Why? Why do you? Why do you think? You, and this makes me uh, another question that you were mentioned earlier, and I think it's really apropos. You talked about Uber, and the when I when I discuss, I usually talk about ordering pizza. Like when I order it from Domino's, I know I know when that sucker's going in the in in the oven. I know who's picking it up. I know where, I can watch it come to my front door. But healthcare, it's not why. In you guys' opinions, in your professional opinions, why are we so behind? So partly it is the lack of standards and the complexity of healthcare data. It's not like simple transaction data. Amazon had an easier list because it's all transaction and price, right? Um, but healthcare is a little bit more complicated to the things that Katow and I were talking about, about the lack of standards for coding, et cetera, et cetera. Another piece though, however, um, is this issue of privacy and security and this tremendous American idea, at least in the United States, that I don't want to have a single unified patient identifier um, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, the culture in America says we don't want to have a single patient identifier. In Canada, they do, as you know, but um, those are those are have been the historic reasons. Um, I think the privacy and security stuff was way overblown. It's taken a while for people to feel comfortable about that. Some of the security breaches uh, have you know, uh, created pause as that's moved along. But we're now seeing AAA, again, as a result of this pandemic, and all we do is cloud here, is we're now transforming many different health systems, large and small, bringing them to the cloud, making that data patient-centered, making it trustable. Uh, that means harmonized, doing all that semantic ontology magic that you know Kitao was, was describing very nice, and then act, making that data actionable to the people that need it when they need it in a way that gives them a clear direction. Just the same way your phone tells you when you're using Waze, oh, there's an accident ahead. By the way, it doesn't know there's an accident. It's a predictive algorithm. Hmm. Um, it could be a tree that fell down. It could be just people slowing down because there's a baby crossing the road. I mean, but you don't know. But it's a predictive. It doesn't matter. You know that if I turn right, I'll save 13 minutes. And you learn to trust that data because we've all tried to fool it, right? And we find out, oh, maybe it was right. And yeah. so really the world we're trying to take health here and doing it very rapidly. Uh, well, I think we, hey, we're, we got a couple questions from the audience. Fritz, do you want to bring up the first question? Yeah, sure. Um, this is from Lauren Kidd. Uh, does this mean that algorithms can predict an illness that has someone else has or something equivalent? So thank I think, you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of time. I mean, I think you look at algorithms. Al algorithms are a series of, um, you know, really predictions based on a model that you give it. So, you know, we, we have, as much as we've digitized or as much of the information that we have that we've coded uh, in healthcare, we, we can look at a whole bunch of it in, in a historical perspective and say, hey, what do we know about, you know, a person who looks like this or a person who has this kind of a condition, where do they statistically or over time, you know, in a quantitative way, where do they end up? And, and, and that's, you know, kind of what you have to be remembering, right, is that it's, it's, it's not an N of one. It's not a single individual. It's, it's, a, it's a model that you build across a lot of data points, a lot, across a lot of variability. And you hope that your model is fairly robust and it can predict, um, you know, with, within a certain amount of, 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 um, of, of accuracy. But it, it's never 100% and you can only trust them as far as you know, the quality of the model. So I think, you know, algorithms abound. They're, they're all over the place. Everything from machine vision programs that... Uh, you know, say, hey, look, I found a tumor on this on this scan. Um, you know, to like that that thing that David talked about, right? Like, there's you know predicted algorithms that say, hey, you you need to take a right turn or a left turn right here. That, that same thing is starting to sort of trickle into medicine. You know, there there are some clinical decision support type of um, you know technologies and algorithms that are saying, you know, if you have this kind of a problem with this kind of you know 
scenario that's going, you know, happening in the patient at this moment with these lab results, you know, this is what we know happens. And so you have an opportunity now to take a left term instead of a right term in the care of that patient. Um, it, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's quantitative. It, it's, you know, you, you hope it's, it's close to 100%. It never is. And, um, you know, they, they keep getting better over time. And so I think the, the idea of algorithms is that they do evolve. It's, it's, a, it's a, almost like a biological system. You can evolve them over time. And a lot of the data science underlying this is, is really about that, right? It, it's about, you know, um, machine-based learning, I mean, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, but the, the idea here is you can keep enriching these models so that they get better. And, and so the algorithms get uh, better over time as well. You know, I, I, I'll add a point of view here that many of the folks in the audience may not be familiar with. You know, that last question was obviously based thinking about a doctor-patient relationship. Like, what can the doctor do or the machines that are supporting the doctor? By the way, we call that a different AI. It's augmented intelligence. We, we prefer that instead of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea is, is that um, we've tried to move toward a model where we think about populations. Um, so not just the individual patient I'm seeing today, because that is a bit medieval again, right? That's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. But, you know, and this is where healthcare is a higher risk than, say, a bookstore, if you use the Amazon example, or cars or Uber. There's, depending on who you are as an enterprise, you have a different investment in, in, in health. So uh, if you're a community, like a city, you have an investment in the, the, the population of that city and the health that they have. If you're in a health system, you have the patients that you serve as a health system, as a population you're interested in. If you have a practice, if you're a doctor with a practice, you have that population of patients that you want to ensure their wellness and their health. If you're an employer, you have the employees and their families that you want to ensure their health. If you're a, a, a payer, an insurer, you have those that are covered members you want to ensure their health. So this is a critical piece. There's the individual and then there's the population. And so um, population health is a very different ball game where you want to keep people healthy. And, and once they have an illness or, or require acute treatment, you want to give evidence-based good treatment and, and have it be the most affordable it can be for them and for the, you as an enterprise. And if they develop a chronic condition like congestive heart failure, diabetes, things that we know are now um, you know, high cost, highly debilitating to the population, you want to minimize the amount of progression of that disease. Someone with diabetes, you want to prevent chronic kidney disease from evolving. So these are key things you think about both as a population as, in, as well as an individual patient. AI, the, the algorithms that, that, that we see people use for populations are like risk determination, their social determinant of health, uh, uh, the, uh, whether or not they have food, whether they're exercising, the kind of interventions they're receiving, who's at risk for going into a hospital, who leaves the hospital, who's at risk for coming back. Um, you know, um, how do you look at individual people's behavior, right? Because we know behavior is a big contributor. Do I smoke? Do I exercise? Do I take care of myself? Do I take my medicines? And then everybody responds to nudges and other things that influence behavior differently. So using AI on large data sets to train and down to the individual level, look at what are the things that really influence their behavior as opposed to someone else. Yeah, there's a tremendous um, plethora of different ways that these algorithms can be used to both care for patients and care for population. Uh, as a follow-up, we have a question from Joe Jackson. Uh, is uh, He wants to know if incorporating genetic mapping, is this a component to what you're talking about, social determinants of health to all the other data? Do you guys see First of all, how how difficult is it to incorporate genetic mapping or genetic uh, information into the, the data lakes and the way you guys incorporate data into the systems, cleaning it up and into everything you create, the infrastructure? How difficult is that? And then do you see that as kind of the nirvana that's going to help uh, solve some of these maybe public health things or uh, individual health things? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it's a good question. I mean, gen genetic mapping, you know, these are analyzers that, you know, look at the DNA sequences, they convert, you know, base pairs into binary. And so it's very structured information. It's, it's not really, a, you know, a problem around whether we can, you know, clean it up. Or, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. But the, the issue is whether you have signals when there's a lot of noise. You know, what do you actually identify as being relevant versus what's not relevant? And so when you look at these, you know, sort of, you know, uh, gene-wide uh, association studies, and you're looking at multiple parts of the DNA sequence that may be related to a condition, 
you map those, you take the insights from the DNA code, you, you know, match it up against what you have in the health record or other type of what we call phenotype data. And then you kind of mash it all together and say, you know, is there an association? So it really, I think, um, you know, some countries have done it really well because they've had small populations like the Icelandic, you know, um, cohort was a really good one to think about because they, they, they had a fairly closed off population. They, they sequenced almost the entire population and they were able to look at the lineage of people over time so they could see where mutations were ending up uh, from one generation to the next. I mean, these are, you know, th that's an ideal state. Now you have, you know, the, the real world where it's, you know, a lot of different people, a lot of different family, people don't know even where they're originating from. Um, you don't have a full uh, government backed or sponsored, uh, you know, gene mapping um, kind of study happening. So, you know, I think in time, if, if we have uh, at least some sort of adequate penetration of gene testing or at least sequencing uh, at a population level, and we have a secure way to, to, to allow research to happen across it, and we have a way for that data to actually be, um, you know, really commingled with phenotype, lifestyle, uh, and other types of, uh, you know, pieces of information that come out of the health record, then we may have a good chance of doing that. But at this point, it's, it's going to be focused on a very, you know, high, high value, high impact type of, of, of mutations, you know, perhaps relating to a specific disease because it relates to whether or not a medication may work or whether or not a medication might be metabolized. So we're kind of at that point right now. The ideal state is obviously going to be one that takes time. You know, there's some very important points you brought in there. You know, the question really at its core, I think, is getting at how do we uh, maintain the health of the population or, or people? And how do you prevent uh, a disease? How can you predict or prevent a disease from emerging or the symptoms emerging? Uh, for the audience, I know we have a broad audience, there we, uh, uh, you know, Katan and I think about prevention in three buckets. There's primary prevention, which is for, you know, a general population or an individual, how do you, how do you keep them well, right? How do you prevent them from having disease? There's secondary prevention, which is if I have a risk factor, both my parents, and this gets into a little genomics, uh, if I have two parents who have hypertension, maybe a long history of heart attacks, I'm at risk. I have a risk factor. And then what are things that can be done when someone's at risk for a condition to help prevent the emergence of that condition? And then I, I alluded to what we call tertiary prevention. Is it, If I have a chronic disease, and I use the example of diabetes, how do I prevent that from uh, evolving into uh, eye damage, losing a toe because of uh, of, of complications or, or, or chronic kidney disease, as example. So these are all things that that we can we can do. The question is a good one about genomics. Good studies around this. We know a lot. Um, uh, if we look at the amount that gen, gen, uh, the genomics contributes to um, the health of an individual or population, it's about only about a ten to fifteen percent. There's about seventeen studies that will look at this breakout of the overall outcome for that patient or population. If you look at um, the social determinants of care, right, the community that they live in, the, the amount of access they have to transportation and food, uh, so on and so forth, um, that's about a 40% contributor to the overall outcome of, of a patient. And the studies vary from, you know, 25 to, you know, 40, 42%. Uh, if you look at um, the behavior of the individual themselves, do they exercise? You know, do they um, do they take their medication? Their personality drives a lot of that. That's another thirty-five to forty percent. Um, what's really really interesting is medical interventions only <laughs> only accounts for ten to fifteen percent of the outcomes of yeah. patients survive. No, it's phenomenal, and this is why there's so much in interest in the social determinants of health. So as we learn more about genomics we'll probably learn more about identifying certain diseases that are highly genetically transmitted or ones that create some risk factors. But it's these other buckets of behavior and social, environmental, economic that are the big drivers of outcomes. And we've just really, as a society, begun to get our arms around. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I remember in medical school reading some paper where they experimented like not treating patients at some point and they found that they did better if they didn't see a doctor. So yeah. <laughs> Because I was like, depressed. I was like, "What am I doing with my life?" Yeah. Um, well, actually, you just, you just answered Denise Jackson's question, right? I mean, she she's asking, "Hey, what changes are you looking to make for the future?" Well, I think that that's right there. Like, how do we how do we use AI to look at those bigger issues, right? Like right. The behavioral the behavioral side of things, the social determinants of health, and and we're getting there, right? I mean, we're using apps and you know snippets of code that can you know collect certain types of information around people's behaviors. 
so that we can start to look at the other side of this, you know, the stuff that happens outside the clinical exam room, which is only a few minutes a year, but like the whole rest of their life, we don't, we don't quantify or understand is stuff that we're starting to be able to have a, a, a chance to peer into. Yeah, you know, there's there's work that has been done in engineering. I spend my life with engineers now, so it's a, it's a very interesting world. Um, you know, uh, if you think about Lockheed, you know, when they built their engines, they they started this concept of the digital twin, and the idea of the digital twin is let's take a look at. So, you know, we built this engine for this aircraft, you know, Boeing 747. Let's create a, an a, an electronic twin of that particular engine that we built and installed in that plane and track its performance over time. And so it's actually acting as if the real one is doing, and it can predict when a certain part in that engine will fail or get close to failure, so that when it lands for servicing, they're predicting and servicing ahead of time. So we're doing work here, um, and, and the whole digital twin is is fascinating area to look at the, you know, yeah. the, the engineering behind it, the statistical and, and, and predictive value that they used around that. We're doing work right now here in Innovacer with some of our, our large health systems at the digital twin for patients and populations of patients, where we're looking at for a population, what influences different individuals' behavior? Where do they live? What's their zip code? What's their credit score? All these things that all these buckets we talked about, and then also their genomic data, and, and also those medical interventions that account for a little bit of the outcome. <laughs> um, we're looking at all this data to look at at the individual level, how can we think about improving the outcomes based on a digital twin, basically like a Sin City uh, that we would, would, would create about that patient in that population. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think it's impossible to have a conversation about healthcare and medicine right now without talking about COVID and everything and how that's changed um, everything. Um, so I'd love to hear what you guys feel COVID will change in the future and how it's changing things now and what might go back to the way it was before. Um, yeah, I think the biggest accelerator of the adoption of technology, especially on telemedicine, remote, remote sensing, remote patient monitoring, I mean, all of that just got a massive leap, um, you know, this year because, or, or in 2020, because, you know, there, there's always this, this notion, right, especially at the, you know, on the commercial side of healthcare, is, you know, new technologies just take a long time to get adopted. I mean, David, you, you alluded to just care guidelines take decades. To get adapted to new technology takes even longer, I think, sometimes. And then all of a sudden, you know, COVID, um, you know, forced all of us as patients, providers, uh, everybody to sort of rethink um, connectivity. And so overnight, you had doctors who were like, "Look, I don't. The telephone is, you know, is technology. I don't understand." And all of a sudden, they're on, they're on, a, you know, a telemedicine viewer, and they're, you know, getting results from a patient from a, you know, from a bunch of telemetric devices at their patient's house. I mean, it, it's just, it's really interesting to see that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but, you know, this has been the year for a lot of that adoption. Uh, and then on, on the other side of this, there's there's the, um, you know, there was, this, there was this race, there was this collective race around the world to take a look at the, 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 the data from patient populations that were, I mean, in those early days, we didn't know how to treat any of this stuff. And, and we need to really mine information. And, you know, some of the work we did at Site Through was really around, you know, let's take these 30 to 60 high impact pieces of data that we know might be interesting or might be important uh, and let's start pulling them out of records and let's take pulling them out of records um, you know from this health system or that health system or this country or that country and and, and put it all together in a format that actually is um, you know you can put it in aggregate and take a look at it because you just couldn't do that before um, and, but you know the focus wasn't there to do that before right it was really you know let's say if somebody had a commercial interest in doing that they would do it but you know suddenly you had a bunch of disjointed organizations who really had to figure out how to share their information um, and way faster than any registry has ever been put together. And, and having an open access uh, you know, to, some, to some of those data sets was also something we've never really seen before. So collaboration just, I think, took off. And, and we're, 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 you know, collaboration for the spirit of collaboration and, and advancement, not, you know, just, you know, kind of quasi or pseudo collaboration for the purpose of something commercially interesting. Uh, I think yeah. that for me was a big deal. Yeah, no, th th these are, those are awesome points. And I, I think going back to the question that was raised before, uh, uh, Jose, was, you know, um, why is it that we're still using these installed data warehouses and systems, you know, these disparate systems? Uh, COVID has really started to change that. And I'll, I'll give an example of a story we, we have at Innovacer. 
one of the, the larger seven, it's a seven state large hospital health system in the country, one of the largest ones, most prestigious. We were discussing how we could help them in a particular type of risk-based contract. Um, and then suddenly COVID happened. And what they realized, and this illustrated the, 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 you know, the plain sight challenge, the plain sight to me and everybody else that works in this digital world that they had. They had people coming out of an ER workflow tool and they needed to get to an ICU and be on a vent and be intubated. And it was about a it was about a six hour lag from when they had visibility in the ER when somebody's under undergoing respiratory distress to where they could say, where's a clean ventilator? Where's a clean, you know, where's an ICU bed that's opened up and has been cleaned? Where's somebody that can intubate? Staff so there's staffing system, supply system, rooming system, ER workflow system. Oh yeah, and then the EMR. So um so the amount of time they had to pull all that together was six hours. And we said, well, listen, why don't we can build a, because we're a data company, we can build a command center for you, pull all that together and integrate because of the way we use machine learning to bring data in and harmonize it. it took us three weeks to build this command center and they shortened that to 15 minutes. Right. Yeah. And now it was effective. And they said, oh my gosh, why do we have all these legacy installed? Like, could you just like bring all this stuff into the cloud and harmonize it in a patient center record? And then we could just tap off of that with a Firebase API and start building apps. Like I'm, I'm going into where the three-year plan is now. We're like, uh, yeah, that's what we're trying to tell you. <laughs> like, so I, I'm using it as a metaphor for trying to tell the industry, but I mean, this is the, it takes some time a crisis for people to have their eyes open up and to also change their behavior. I mean, we all know this. It's hard to change behavior. Yeah. A solution isn't really a solution until they've arrived at the, uh, you know, the, to the notion that they actually want a solution. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, totally right. I mean, this has been on your roadmap long before COVID, I'm sure. And it's just suddenly had a moment. It's, yeah. In the days of the shipping magnets with the big sails and they kept making, making bigger ships with more sails. And, and, you know, when the wind would stop, they'd stop moving. <laughs> and like these, Chunky, dirty steamboats were chugging a by, making port to port, and same time, predictable. And they said, like, who would ever want to ship on one of those? Let's make a bigger ship, more sales. Right. Like, it took a crisis to suddenly say, oh, well, let's do that because it's more, you know, it's the right thing to do. And 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 that that you know, this is the history of innovation. Yeah, yeah. there's that old adage that uh, necessity is the mother of innovation, right? Yeah. So, Fritz, do you have another question? Yeah, um, I thought we were going to pull up, I think it was Tanisha's question. Um, so obviously we all know that like this, there's going to be another pandemic, there's going to be another situation like that. But how do you think all this data and all of the, the choices that people had to make now and like the things we've learned, how do you think this will help predict and maybe prevent the next pandemic, the next big thing? And Dr. Patel, I'll add a little bit more. Maybe you could show us uh, if you have the how you guys actually pull out information from um, from a process, from like a, a script, or how you actually glean information from data. Yeah, I mean, if you want to go to that third slide, it's just really a bunch of blocks of color. But then it was the the idea of what we do. So, Tanisha, to your point, I mean, if you if you have this ability to take information. And it's all over the place, right? To David's point, it's all over the hospital. It's in, it's trapped in different systems. It's, it could be in a very structured format, or it could be very unstructured. It's just a bunch of narrative, um, you know, words and phrases and paragraphs and, and and multiple pages of these things. And if you have an approach, and that's what natural language processing allows you to do, is to sort of say, look, I want to look at these pages, and I want to really go in and use all these different you know, techniques to figure out, well, what is it that here is a fact around a medication? What is a dose? What is a lab value? What is you know, uh, a symptom or something a patient's complaining about? And all those things are kind of documented very differently or they have a different sort of place where they exist in the, in the various types of health records. So AI, you know, natural language processing, all these various um, you know, technologies, what they do is they really try to you know, really make this thing very granular, right? Let's break it right down at the, not the quantum level, but at least at the at what we call tokens, uh, you know, at where, where there's a concept or something that's very important um, that can stand on its own as as an idea or a, or a finding in, in the record. And when you have everything kind of you know made super granular like this, now you can start to build you know higher order you know questions into it, like you know people who have uh, you know fevers who present with cough, 
you know, what do we know about, you know, this or that about them? And, and so you can ask those kinds of questions. We can't ask a lot of these kinds of questions right now in the existing electronic medical record systems because a lot of this unstructured information is just kind of filed away. And the only real data that's kind of available is, you know, when did the patient arrive? When did the patient leave? And what, you know, what's your billing, um, you know, codes uh, associated with that visit? Um, but now we can peer way, way, you know, deeper. We can get right into this, the phrases that a person might have uttered during a conversation. And if they were trapped either through an audio feed or they're trapped through, you know, the way the, you know, the, the position of the provider documented them, now we can go in and say, you know, some you know, people who complained of a lack of taste or a lack of smell, um, you know, how often is that happening? So really, I think as we digitize things and we digitize images, we digitize words, we turn all of this information into really zeros and ones, we have this superpower, right, which is to go in and be able to analyze it all. And that's ultimately, I think, you know, what's going to you know, help us guard against the next pandemic is the ability to share information when it's, when it's happening, you know, in a faraway place. And, you know, hopefully they're starting to collect this information. We have access to that. We can collaborate. We can, we can take some of these um, insights that they've generated and then reverse, you know, take those insights and turn them into questions of our own population data and, and do surveillance. So it's, it, it's kind of really, you know, it, I mean, I'm presenting an ideal state, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, these are the sort of ideas that get us to that. So how does, how does that happen though? That uh, this is the, the nuts and bolts of the process, but it sounds like it's a systemic problem. And David, you touched on this and, and Keaton, you touched on this. Uh, we talked about, you know, standardizations and data sharing what where at what level does that change need to occur like we have the tools right you've created you guys are utilizing the tools and creating the tools but it, it seems like it's a it's a higher it's it's a governmental problem almost and how, at who needs to be having this conversation and who needs to be trying to have a solution to be able to have the data available to be able to evaluate it using these tools and these algorithms to be able to prevent something like this, or at least see it coming perhaps months or years before it occurs? Well, from a, a government standpoint, um, uh, you know, we, we apparently haven't really learned a lot. Um, uh, I'm sure, Katan, you and I both read, you know, and are familiar with the 1970-1919 flu epidemic. Um, and, and, you know, many of the lessons learned there, some of the case studies, like what, how St. Louis versus Philadelphia handled, you know, the dealing with uh, public health, we, we didn't learn. We're doing the same thing all over again. So uh, there is a public health component, a public policy pers perspective that I'm hoping we learn uh, this time around. Um, uh, clearly, we haven't done a very good job, uh, at least here in the, in the United States. Um, I think there's a tremendous advantage, though, to speak to the question you're linking it to data and the work that uh, Citru is doing, the work we're doing in Evaser. Um, I'll go back to the medieval, what close to the medieval, it started in the 1950s. Do you know that most of the point-to-point uh, 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 -point information shared in healthcare, the standard is by facts, right? The, no, <laughs> I saw the eyebrows go up, and you know this. Right? If I want to get information from another provider as a physician, they have to fax it to me. They can't email it to me. They have to fax it to me. So they are. So the tremendous work around that I think, you know, SciTrue has done that we've been working with SciTrue and we've been doing here is that, you know, we can run an OCR program, take scan images uh, off that PDF, you know, parse the sentence like we all did in middle school when we broke down a sentence to really understand that. And then try to attach codes to it where codes exist or to make sense of it, and then really start to use AI to ask questions about what has taken place in that written record. And, and I'm, so that's a workaround to kind of get us into the, the world that the High Tech Act didn't get us into. And hopefully we can start incorporating that in our public policy and public health to start at, you know, adding you know, predictive work to say, how do we can look at the emergence right, of, of these kind of, of viruses that can emerge and get our arms around them very quickly without the politics. I'm a little skeptical with the history of humankind that the politics will never come out of it, but that, that would be, I think, the approach. Yeah. All yeah. right. Um, thank you so much. We're, we're getting to right the end of it. Sorry, um, running out of time. So thank you so much for, for chatting with us. And thank you. I'm sure the audience really appreciated everything you guys talked about. It was really, like, I feel like I learned so much. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys very much. I think we could probably go for another hour easily. So maybe we'll need to do a, 
uh, a second session and we can dig into some of these other comments, but really appreciate both of your guys' times. Really appreciate what you've been doing for the industry and for uh, patients, both at the bedside and through and through your own uh, agencies and companies. So thank you both. And thank you again for spending your, your hour with us. It's a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for having us. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and uh, stay tuned for next month where we're having NVIDIA come in and talk about some of the cool things that they're doing with uh, their processors and uh, all the cool AI stuff that NVIDIA is doing right now. So thank you very much and we'll see you guys next month.